We're beginning a new series today, and I'm always excited and nervous about beginning a new series, but take your Bibles and find Habakkuk or Habakkuk, however you wish to say it, and you'll, you'll be there in about 10 minutes and we'll be ready to go, but uh, I'm going to call the series The Best is Yet to Come, How Believers Serve a Great God in an Evil World. My parents have been cleaning out my grandparents' house. It's a big job. It's a painstaking job. It's, a, it's somewhat of a painful thing to do. All the memories, missing Mima, who passed away a few months ago. Granddaddy died back in the very beginning of 2008. But like most people who live well into their 80s, and then my Meemaw, 96. They had a lot of stuff. Let me just say it a different way. They had a lot of junk. <laughs> I mean, there was some good stuff. They even had some pretty good furniture. Praise God. I mean, we got some of it, and it's, it looks nice. And I remember my grandparents, uh, when I walked past it, it's just a, a nice thing. Um, but I, I got, let me show you. I got one thing here I got. I'm normally not a prop preacher. Can you say amen? I don't like bringing things up here. That's just not my style, but I got this bad boy right here. Ooh, man, this thing comes in handy. That someone won't let me in traffic. I just do that right there. Oh, 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 yes, oh I saw this. Go, 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 go right here. No, I, I've never done that. For that would be illegal to impersonate a police officer. And this is uh, my grandfather's lieutenant badge from the Memphis Police Department from which he retired in 1973. Man, that was a while ago. No, you can't have this. And I'm not telling you where I hide it because that would be bad in the wrong hands. Uh, I did have it in my car for a moment and then I thought this is too tempting. <laughs> so I put it at the house, of course. Um, but amidst all the stuff... Uh, my parents came across either at their house or my grandparents' house, but they're just, they're constantly, here's a, here, we thought you'd want this. Hey, come look at this. And, and I'm going to tell you, my wife's about, we're about to climb the wall. We've got boxes sitting here, there. And I was going to ask if there are any volunteers that really love their pastor and his family, if you have some available storage that we could use at your house, please come up to me after the service. We're running out. But amidst all of us, all of it, th my parents handed me a little coffee mug that said, Boy Scouts, Kayakima, 1986. I got that mug some 35 years ago as an 11-year-old boy when I went over to Arkansas and I experienced for the first time Boy Scout camp. I'd been on Cub Scout camps, but not Boy Scout camps. And I want to tell you that a couple of different times on that trip, I went into my tent and just cried and cried and cried. I, I was 11 years old, so I think, around that age, and I had never been before exposed to all of the filthy language and dirty stories and talks about drinking booze. I was around some juniors and seniors in high school that week, and that was a first for me. My little heart was tender. I was already Christian long before that point, and while I would not be a perfect teenager or a perfect adult, and I'm still, wor actually, I, he's working on me still, amen, but there was just a, a realization that I lived in a dark, dark world. Then and since then, God's word in First John, or in John 17, the high priestly prayer rings true in my ears. I have given them your word, Jesus said, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. 
I don't know about you, but I think the world, or at least the world in which I find myself, has gotten a bit worse since 1986. I don't know about you. I want to get out of here. If I have to stay, I sure wish the Lord would send a mighty revival. But sometimes I, I'm like James and John. I wish he'd send fire and brimstone on those bad people over there or over there. Or those people doing that in Hollywood or Washington or the Northeast or in Memphis. And, and I remember James and John, I feel the rebuke that they felt. Because the scripture says when they said that, he rebuked them. And he said, in effect, I didn't come to do that. I came to save them too. Turn with me to one of the least known prophets, Habakkuk. Not mentioned anywhere else in all of the prophets or historical narrative or New Testament, but quoted by the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans to be the foundational principle for his entire, and the word of God's entire doctrine of salvation by faith alone. Read with me in Habakkuk chapter 1. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear. Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore perverse judgment proceeds. I want to preach to you in our series about how to live in an evil world. Questions that come up. And answers that come down. That's the title. Questions that come up and answers that come down. This is a look at questions the prophet asked God and the answers God gave. Question number one. The preacher's question or the prophet's question. Habakkuk, in effect, asked, How long before my prayers are answered? Verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? It, this is a burden, verse 1 says. In other words, Habakkuk is writing down something that he, he's found a message from God and he's burdened to unload it to the people around him because probably the people around him were asking the same questions he was asking. Let me give you just a little background because this is not something probably that everyone's exceedingly familiar with, the book of Habakkuk. Without getting too complicated or bogged down in detail, scholars are divided to, as to exactly when this was written, but most of them agree there is a, a broad time in which it could have been written, but not that broad, between 641 years before Christ and 598 B.C., probably closer to the latter date. Most likely he saw the reforms of the godly King Josiah. Remember Josiah, if you don't, let me just tell you, he was a breath of fresh air for the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom. He, he tore down the idols. He restored worship in the temple. It's as if God's people, at least in the southern kingdom, had experienced a great revival and returned to him. But not long after, there was a king, two kings later, called Jehoiakim. And probably Habakkuk saw the goodness under Josiah, but then lived and ministered all the way to another king named Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was exceedingly evil, and everything spiritually that was advancing seemed to come to a screeching halt with this king. This is the king that took Jeremiah's scroll that Barak the scribe had, had penned the very words of God on and ripped it up and thrown it away. Like many older people here, Habakkuk could see a progression of evil from the time he was younger 
to the time he was older. One reason is that this time would have been contemporaneous with the time that God in his sovereignty and in his wisdom allowed the Chaldean army to absolutely ravish the known world. So there's your background. Back to the question, God, how long before my prayers are answered? Do you ever feel that way? Lord, we've been praying forever. I dare say this past year that some of us who have have lived uh, almost, and some of you the entire time, but I myself almost the entire time that abortion has been legal in this country, we were wondering, will this terrible federal decision from the Supreme Court that allows for unlimited, unrestricted almost abortion Will it ever be overturned? And many people even told me it'll never happen. I had a young man tell me years ago in this church, he grew up in this church, he said it wasn't that crucial who you vote for because that'll never be overturned. Well, I'm proud to say he was wrong, and I dare say he's glad that he was wrong. This isn't a message against abortion, although you've heard plenty of those, and I certainly am vehemently opposed to abortion. That's a real human being. But this is a message to say, do we not feel at times that the best is behind? It's not yet. And, and we're stuck in this evil world, and we're wondering, we're wondering how in the way, world do we live, and we ask God this question, Lord, are you ever going to answer my prayers? Look what Habakkuk said. He said, why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble for plundering and violence are before me? You see that word violence? That's the word He ended verse 2 with, even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. That's an interesting word. It's a word that means cry out in horror. It's the Hebrew word hamas. It's a word we'll see several more times in this prophecy, but it means, church, a total lawlessness that brings chaos and harm to others. What's the first part of this question? His question is, well, are you going to answer my prayers ever? Because here's what I see. Morality is absolutely ignored. It's pushed aside. Morality is pushed aside. Wayland Bailey, an Old Testament scholar and commentary author, said this, can any book be more up to date than the tone which questions the prosperity of the wicked and the demise of the righteous? Habakkuk asked the questions the suffering people of his day were asking, how can the wicked prosper? How can God not answer when the righteous suffer? More importantly, he was not content to hear human philosophies about these questions. He asked God to answer these questions. I'll tell you one thing for Habakkuk. He went to the right source. Amen? He went to the Lord. And John The apostle wrote, we know we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. We recognize as Christians, we may pray and pray and pray. We may kneel. We may wear two places on the carpet where we kneel. I doubt many people are doing that. I certainly can't be accused of doing that. I need to pray more. But but the the reality is, it may seem like God never answers our prayers in our lifetime. And we're going to come back to that thought. It sounds like a, a pessimistic thought. It sounds like a real downer, but we'll come back to it because in the end, the, there's only good news. Verse 3 shows us that the prophet questions God's ways. Lord, I mean, here we are. We're the good people. We're crying out. We're, even, we're crying out, and you won't save us. And you're showing us iniquity and they're plundering. There is strife and contention arising into verse 3. And then look at verse 4. Therefore the law is powerless. That's the second part of, of his bewilderment. The law is paralyzed. One translator says you could translate it, the law is numbed. The, the, the law is of no effect. There's chaos. There's no law and order. Do we hear anything about law and order in our news cycle these days or the lack thereof? Yes, we do. Then look back in verse 4. It says, and justice never goes forth. 
Praise God we, we can't say that today. I mean, we can say oftentimes there is no justice, but we can't say it never goes forth. But justice is perverted. The picture is here of a horde of false witnesses that causes the judge to let the guilty go un. Punished. By the way, let me just say this. This is not really a message on politics at all, but let me just say this because I think most of us have either voted or will be voting very soon. Let me say this no matter where you lean, today is a different day than 1965. The far left, let me just say that this the far left will never stop until they have raped, pillaged, and damned this nation to the uttermost. If you think they're ever going to go away, you are sorely naive. Justice is perverted. Wickedness prevails. Look at the rest of verse 4. For the wicked surround the righteous. In other words, church, the righteous people are here, but we're in the minority. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Wickedness prevails. My goodness, if you doubt it, look what's happening in this country right now. <laughs> I recently saw a news story where a parent was challenging a school board. I believe it was in Virginia where the governor and first lady are promoting a program and a policy in the public schools there that says this, and I quote, school divisions will need to consider the health and safety of the student in situations where students may not want their parents to know about their transgender status. There are no regulations requiring school staff to notify a parent or guardian of a student's request to affirm their gender identity. Well, you've got to notify your parents when you're not passing and it's midterm. You've got to uh, notify your parents and get them to sign a form. If you're going to play on the football team, you've got to show you've had a physical and your parents have to give you permission to, to play on the football team or cheer on the squad or go on the tr field trip, but not if you are changing or deciding at a young, impressionable age where you really don't know up from down, right from wrong, especially if you're not raised in a Christian home, you can't notify the parents if they've decided to change their sex. To which this challenging parent said, it's universal wisdom and we have practiced in this country in pediatrics and child psychology that it is never ever right to ask a child or to agree with the child to keep a secret from their parents. But now, in this case, apparently, it's the thing to do. God help us. Wickedness is seeming to just ooze out of every corner of society. The point is, and by the way, praise God, people are speaking up. I think there's still hope. I don't know about you. I think there's still hope. Amen? Even for America, there's still hope. But the point is, we feel like at times we've prayed for revival, we've prayed for God to intervene, we've prayed for this, we've voted our convictions, we, we feel like the prophet, how long, God? Why are you not saving us? Why? Why is attendance not coming back more after COVID? Why is revival not happening? Why are people not walking the aisle? Why is wickedness? Why are people being mowed down on the streets? Why is Memphis a city that sees well over 300 murders every day? year. God, why are you not doing something about it? Well, God had an answer. He has an answer now, but he had an answer then. Look at God's answer. Look at verse 5. Look, God, God tells Habakkuk, in effect, this is the understanding, church, you're going to see something in your lifetime. Look, watch for it. Look, where do you look? Among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. So God's answer is this. I've labeled it see and be shocked. And let's see what he's to be shocked about. For I will work a work in your days, which would, you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. 
They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening, evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold for they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. Then his mind changes and he transgresses. He commits offense ascribing this power to his God. What's all this about? Well, this is God raising up a wicked army and allowing them to do the unthinkable. It's going to seem like, Habakkuk, that I'm never going to answer your prayer, but I'm answering it now by telling you what I'm going to do. God doesn't exactly answer the why of Habakkuk's prayer. He really doesn't directly answer the prayer, but he gives an answer. And I think we need to know from that truth, from that principle, that it's right to seek God, it's right to question and bring our questions to God, and it's right to hear what God has to say, but don't just look for the answer that you want. Accept the answer you get. God knows every move he's going to make. God is in total control of everything. His ways, the prophet Isaiah said, are not our ways. God uses wicked people. He raised up Pharaoh. Do you think the Israelites had ever experienced anything before? Do you think God's people had ever experienced, God's preachers had ever experienced the, the, the feeling that God's not hearing us 430 years, slaves in Egypt. Think about it. I mean, the time just goes on and on and on, but God was working a plan. God was going to raise up Moses. God was going to bring them through the Red Sea and across the wilderness. And even people dying in the wilderness probably thought, Lord, when are we ever going to get to go into the promised land? But God was working his plan. You see, the Bible teaches this very clearly. God is never evil, and he's never party to evil. John says, in, he is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And yet, God allows evil, and in his sovereignty, he raises up evil kings. That is, they didn't get to where they are without him allowing them to do what they already desired and had the means to do. He's in total control. And like a master chess player, he's not making the moves of the adversary, but he knows every move the adversary will ever make, and he knows how to bring absolute victory to himself and his people. But sometimes it just seems bad. Isaiah chapter 28 you have this kind of idea. I just want to read this, this little passage of Scripture. Isaiah 28, 21 through 23. For the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perizim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his awesome work, and bring to pass his act, his unusual act. Now, therefore, do not be mockers, lest your bonds be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord, God of hosts, a destruction determined even upon the whole earth. What's Isaiah saying? He's saying, you're going to see some things. Don't accuse God. Don't be bondage to your idea of God. God is going to allow the whole earth to come under the sway of evil. And isn't that what John the Apostle said? The whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. One of the very last verses of his epistle, 1 John. What does God do when he judges? What does God do? Well, we know this. God does allow the Hitlers, the Stalins, the Saddam Husseins, the Osama bin Ladens, the Mao Zedongs. God allows these people for a short time 
to do things, and it may not seem like a short time to us. They blaspheme, and God will allow this again. Many times God's judgment is simply this. Oh, you don't want me? Oh, oh, you, you, want, you want to worship that piece of wood? Oh, you want to worship the silver? You want to worship the stone? Oh, you want to find your completeness, your meaning in something else other than me? Oh, you want to do sexual perversion? That's what you want to do. You want to just stamp your uh, approval on that. And you want to say, I'm okay with it, and I created people like that. Oh, you want to do that? Okay, I'm just going to let you do that. I'm just going to step back. That's why he said through the prophet Hosea, Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. That is some of God's most common and most severe judgment is for him to just say, okay, I'm stepping back. Have it your way. I mean, just like Burger King, have it your way. You want to have it your way? Go right ahead. God says, look, I'm going to raise up a wicked army and give them victory over the earth. I don't have time to go through all of this, but this army that we read through this, and it's a little strange and cryptic, but you know, people in the southern kingdom, they wouldn't have had a whole lot of exposure to horses. I mean, they didn't use horses in agriculture in their terrain. Horses were animals of war. And the picture here is just a deafening sound of the hoofbeats of thousands upon thousands of cavalrymen rush, rushing in to siege and take over God's people's land. And we know it did happen, and there was the captivity, the exile in Babylon. So here's the scene. You've got this prophet. He's been praying. He remembers Josiah. He remembers the good old days. How many of you remember the good old days. I know they weren't that great for some people, amen? But, but there was a in, more innocent time. There was a time when things were, uh, for the most part, more godly. For the most part, there were more morals. And you remember that. And, and, and here's Habakkuk, and he remembers that. And then he, the, here is a new administration. Here is a, a wicked king. And God, why aren't you answering my prayer? God says, look, you're going to be shocked. I want you to see what's actually going to happen, which begs another question. Preacher's question. This is number three, but the second question. Lord, why do you not punish evil? He, he's talking about their evil at first. But then I think what he's possibly thinking is, well, I know we're bad down here in Judah, and I know I was complaining about how bad we are, but they're a lot worse. Do you ever do that in your mind? Well, I know my sin is, is, is kind of bad, but man, it's not as bad as that sin over there. Well, there are sins that lead to worse consequences and are more of a display of God's judgment, but all sin is serious. All sin separates us from God. And here's, here's how he poses the question. Are you not, verse 12, from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. In other words, we're your people. You, you, you're, you've put your name with us. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. It's them, Lord. See that? O rock, you have marked them for correction. You are a pure eyes and to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? Let me just explain some of this. First of all, he's saying, Lord, you're our God. Lord, you're not, we're wicked, yes, but, but you're going to let a less righteous person devour a more righteous person? Did you, did you catch that? But, but see, God, you're our God. You're not their God. Lord, you judge evil, verse 13. We know your standards. We know you're a holy God. Thirdly, Lord, you, you, won't, you will not tolerate sin. But wait a minute, how can you? It seems as though you are. And then fourthly, why therefore do you tolerate the most vicious of all evil people? Th this is like... These people are like animals, verse 14. Verse 15, they take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. 
This is, this is like the people in verse 11. They're, they're on every, that verse 11 can be translated, the wind changes and he transgresses. The idea is this is a people. They're so wicked on, on whatever whim they have, they do evil and they say, look what our God has done. Little g, the God they serve, the God they worship, the false God, the pagan God, the demonic God. I say, why, why, Lord, do you do this? But here's the last part of it. Look with me. Look at verse 17. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what, and what I will answer when I am corrected. It's as if Habakkuk says, and I'm reading into it, I'm going to confess. It's as if he says, I know what the truth is. And I know what I've asked God. I know I just don't understand some things. But I'm going to wait on the rampart. How many of you wait on the rampart? You know, that's something we do every day, right? <laughs> you know. but, but it's the tower. It's the wall. It's where you would, you would be. You would Listen, you would position yourself so you could see the enemy. What Habakkuk is saying, I'm going to position myself to hear from the holy God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. And that's what we need to do. Lord, why do you not punish evil? These are the things we know about you. And these are the things we know that are going on now. And Lord, we're having a hard time reconciling these things. But here's the final part of the prayer. Lord, but we know that you'll set us straight. We know that you, Lord, you alone have the words of life. You have the answers. I tell you what, you got to say for Habakkuk, he knew where to go. Do you know where to go? Here's God's answer. This is number four and the final point. Write down my word so people can live. Write down my word so people can live. Let me show you that. Verse two, chapter two, then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Number one, God says, this is the future. It's a future vision. It's, it's not yet. You're going to have to wait on the Lord. Folks, we need to understand we have to wait on the Lord. Isaiah told us, he told the people of his day rather, and it speaks to us all the way today, some 2,600 years later, but they that wait on the Lord will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and they will not faint. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? <clears throat> I think it means this, you trust the Lord. And I'm going to tell you why I think that in a minute, but I came across this Psalm and it reminds me really of God's economy and all that he's doing. It's Psalm 125. It's a very short Psalm, five verses, listen to it. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. By the way, verse one, that's a good proof text for the fact that God is literally going to come back and set his feet on that mountain and he's going to reign from Jerusalem. This is something permanent. And God and the people that trust God, they are permanent. The heathen are not so. They're like the shaft of the wind, the, the word of God says. But as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest. This is such a curious verse. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous reach out their hands to iniquity. I had never seen that before. I just happened across it. God says his people are permanent. But God says in this life, there will always be the rule of wicked people, lest the righteous people 
be tempted to reach out to iniquity. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. As for such as turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them away with the workers of iniquity. In other words, Lord, you're going to ultimately do good to those who are yours and ultimately judge those who are not. This is a future vision. I just need to say to you, church, I wish many days it were not so. But we may have to wait. We may have to wait. We may not see a revival in our lifetime. We may not see, I don't think you can experience personal revival. I think God can do anything he wants. But we may not see what we want to see. That's what I'm saying. We might have these questions that we come to God and we say, God, how long are you silent? Even when I cry out violence, Lord, it's total chaos and we're looking to you. And God, why do you let these wicked people go on? But God says this, there's coming a day. You need to look and see what my word says. And you need to trust me. It's an accurate vision. Verse 3, did you see that? What a beautiful, beautiful depiction. It says, it will not lie. That vision will not lie. What I'm going to show you is the truth. It's an accurate vision. It's an imminent vision. Notice this. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. That seems like a contradiction. He's saying it seems like it's tearing. It seems like I'm waiting. I'm putting things off. It seems like it's never going to happen. But wait because ultimately it will happen. It will not tarry. It's an imminent vision. Did you know Jesus can come back at any moment? Did you know that? Nothing has to happen. We don't have to go sign up for seven more mission trips and then, oh, they finally did it. Now I can come back. There is a time that's been fixed for all of eternity when Jesus Christ is going to part the clouds, evacuate his church, raise the dead in Christ, and then after seven years appear with the armies of the Lord and all the hosts of heaven and make things right, praise his holy name. Oh, let me tell you, we need to know how to live in an evil world. And there are questions that come up, but praise God for his holy word. There are answers that come down. And this is the last part of the vision. And this is the best part of the vision. It's a future vision. It's an accurate vision. It's an imminent vision. But friend, it's a saving vision. Look what it says. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Oh, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, ultimately it's been applied that those who are righteous, the way they live is they trust God. And then it was ultimately reversed. The way they become righteous is that they trust God. How do the righteous live? They trust God. How do they get life in the first place? They trust God. One uh, commentator was referencing uh, this verse and Paul's speech about it and he, he talked about the origins of trusting God, but he didn't go back far enough. He didn't go back to Genesis 12 and that's where we see Abraham believed God and God said, because of that, I declare you as righteous. Trust my word. Trust my character. We'll get to the woes next week in the vision. God's saying, look, he's going to show him. well, here's, here's, here's what I will judge. Here is my character. See, in this life, we don't have to know all that God's going to do with every detail in which he's going to do it. God knows we need to just know him. Amen? God says, I'm enough. God says, meaning him, he's enough. How do we respond to this? Here's a 2,600-year-old prophecy. Does it have anything for us today? Well, of course, God's Word does. I think we, just, we can take away six things. I'll just shoot these at you quickly and we'll close. Number one, God can handle questions and will provide the answers you need and not the answers you don't need. He may not provide the answers you want, but he'll provide the answers you need. And every answer is in this book that you need. It's been made plain. And, 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 here's, and here's what's beautiful about it. It says that he may run who reads it. What's that mean? Write down my word so that, that the people who read it will have a guide for their life. 
So they will know the answers you're seeking, Habakkuk. And God can handle these questions. He gives us the answers. Number two, our ways are not God's ways. You know what Habakkuk didn't do? He didn't go to the popular culture of the day to find out these perplexing enigmas. No. He went to the Word of God. And that's where we need to go. Oh, there are a lot of opinions out there. Oh, there's a lot of of things emerging out of the university. There's a lot of things coming out of uh, this association, that association, this think tank, this focus group, this denomination, this group of preachers, this author, this blogster. Friend, I want you to know those will come and they will go, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. It's the word of God. Nowhere to go for answers. Number three, God uses wicked people. You you say, well, that's just hard for me. Well, I understand that. But what's the alternative? Can you put on your thinking cap? What's the alternative? Well, I can't do anything with what they're doing. Maybe I can... Let's see. Let me think up a strategy to counter their move. No, God's in control. He's not causal. He's not party to evil, but he uses wicked people for his glory. Number four, all sin is serious. But as we're going to see, idolatry and sexual perversion demonstrate lostness and bring stronger judgment. Number five, no matter what happens, worship the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Put your, like, he got on the rampart. I don't know what that means for you. Maybe it means setting aside some time to be still and know that he is the Lord. Maybe it means being intentional to hear from God. But know that you've got to wait on the Lord. It's interesting that Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 15 talks about Abraham and says he waited on the promise. He waited. He was blessed. He obtained the promise because he waited. He trusted God. Finally, number six, and I love this one. Habakkuk is there. He's asking these questions. And then he gets these answers and he regurgitates it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It was a burden that he had to offload, if you will, to to the people. And here's what that tells me. He couldn't see it at the time. He asked the questions. But God was at work. Friend, you may not can see it, but God's always at work. Amen? Do you believe that today? God's at work. Hey, Hey, they may be doing this in Virginia. They may be doing this over here in Nashville and doing this and doing that. And and, and things may become unraveled. God is at work. God is in control. Just last month, well, September, September, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association had done a lot of preparation in Mongolia. Mongolia. Mongolia had been communist from 19, the 1920s, I think, until the late 1980s, or I think maybe until 1990, 91. All that time. In 1989, reports tell us there were three churches and a handful of Christians. Today, there are 60,000 believers in Mongolia. 60,000. Do you not think that some of those people in one of those three churches said, Violence! God, it's chaos! God, have you left us in Mongolia? I'm sure they felt that way, but God was at work. They did their crusade. Franklin Graham preached to crowds of over 10,000 every night. Over 2,000 people made decisions for Christ. This is September 11 and 12 of this year. And, and, and among the people were senior adults. I mean, hello, senior adults being saved. 
Hey, God, if God can save a senior adult, he can save anyone. They're set in their ways. Amen. Amen, senior adults. Wave at me. Amen. Amen. Neuroscientist. A neuroscientist was saved. They're too smart to believe in God. No, he heard the story of Jesus and his cross and his love, and he said, that's what I need. I'm going to go to hell if I don't get saved. You can read about this in Decision Magazine, November edition. Don't take my word for it. Why am I telling you this? I'm saying things may seem meager, and we may kind of huddle together in the cold, sinful world in which we find ourselves and try to make some heat for the Lord and say, can we kind of stoke some flames here and get things going for the Lord? And I wish the Lord would hear us. And I'm telling you, he's in absolute control and he's still at work. The question is, do you know him right now?